Okay, students, uh, welcome back. And uh, what we're going to do this morning or this afternoon uh, is hand back some exam printouts. And uh, let me just remind you that there's SI coming up next Monday. Um, and we're going to hand back your exam uh, one printouts and bring it up to 100% power. Okay, students, uh, let's talk about your printouts and the exam. Uh, we'll, I'll, I'll do a little talking about the exam again uh, on Tuesday. But for now, um, your, um, first of all, your exam one iClicker points are already up. I did those last night. Uh, and it looks like this uh, on the, um, you know, the grades page. So you'll have three scores for exam one. Exam one clicking, exam one Scantron, and you know what that is now. It's, it's the, basically the raw score in your printout. And then the sum of those two is your exam one total. Now, they're not all put together yet. I'll probably do that this weekend because we, we had a couple people with Scantron mess-ups, and so that takes a little bit of time, and the data doesn't come through for them, so we got to go put that in by hand. And, uh, so those bloopers and stuff, a few of you, which, you know, in past semesters, I have given bonus points to the entire class if nobody messes up their PID. Now, four people, and I'm not looking at anybody, I'm not going to identify them. But right now, four people kind of messed up their PID. So, but I think maybe exam two, I'll make that a bonus point condition. If everybody and absolutely everybody gets their PID right, bubbled in correct. I see guys in the back are going like this already. So, good. That's good. I'm just cheer I, I love to see cheerful and enthusiastic students. Keeps me young. Uh, but I'll do that for exam two. All right. And uh, so hopefully, you know, nobody will for, forget. To, the, and the reason is if you forget your PID, then we kind of don't know what to do with your test. You're going to dig it out of the pile. The pile's not uh, alphabetized. It's a pain in the you know what. But, you know, we do it, but sometimes it's kind of slow. We got it done pretty fast today, though. All right. So anyways, uh, uh, this now my next point to you is, this printout that you're looking at, um, it doesn't have the iClicker scores on it. You know, they don't know anything about the iClickers that I do. They just do the Scantrons. Okay, so the raw score is correct out of 45, but that's only out. So that's your I, that's your Scantron, exam one Scantron score. That is correct. So if you got 36 or 27 or whatever you do, um, that's your raw points. Now, the percent correct... Um, is accurate for the Scantron portion, but not for the test. So you can't. So that percentage over there, uh, you can't really go by that percentage for the test itself. Now that's perfectly true for for what they know of the test, but they only know 90% um, of the test, first 45 points. Right? They don't know. If, but you'll be able to do that as soon as I uh, put all the update all the scores in uh, web courses, and then you'll look at your exam one total. And that'll be good. Now, I want everybody to look at your printout and uh, raise your – before I do this, uh, who didn't get their printout yet? Raise your hand if you didn't get a printout. I know there's one person. Okay, just one person? You two? No? Only one per – because, you know, you, sometimes people come in a little late, and so we tell them to wait. We'll catch you after class, okay? Um, unless your name is – uh, Valeria Villalpando, okay, at the top of the list. Uh, anyway, so what I want you to do is check your printout for double answers, okay? And, whoa, excuse me. Okay, check your printout for double answers, and you'll be able to see it. It'll, you'll, it'll have an, in the combo that says student, it'll have like A and then C, A comma C. And uh, so check that carefully. 
And then the other thing I want you to do is check for blanks. Okay, so sometimes if you if you don't write in an answer, uh, you know you overlook it or you, you forget to come back to it for whatever reason, uh, it'll write it'll 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 have the word blank. Okay, now what we can do for both of those cases, we can go back in and uh, and actually dig out your Scantron and see if it really is blank or if you erased it a little too much. Or, and the same with double answers. Sometimes students erase one answer and then put it a good answer, and but they don't erase the first one enough, so the computer thinks it's two and therefore incorrect. All right, but I will be able to look, and I'll know if you try to erase it and give you the points if you got it correct. Now, if you erase the correct answer, bubbled in a wrong answer, then, you know, there's no change. But if you did uh, uh, erase a wrong answer and bubble in uh, the other one, the correct one, I'll be able to tell. Okay, so we want to be able to look at those. Now, raise your hand if you had a double answer. Anybody? A couple of people. How many people had blanks? A couple. All right. It's usually it's just usually one or two students, so it's not a big deal. Um, now I want you to keep these. Uh, these are going to help you have a, a nice little study guide for the final. All right, because what I'll also publish for you is something I call a blurb sheet, and the blurb sheet gives you a little blurb about each question, except for the matching. Uh, on the test. So true, false, and multiple choice, you'll, you won't have the verbatim question, all right? But you will have a little uh, short phrase or even a sentence about that question that'll tell you, okay, I better read up on um, free fall for the final. And I'll do this for every exam. And so by the end of the semester, you'll have three of these, hopefully, and three blurb sheets, and then going into the final, you'll be able to say, well, I missed this and this, a lot of this stuff on exam one, and I missed a lot of this other stuff on exam two. I better study up a little extra on that topic to get ready for the final, All right? So keep this, definitely, all right? Now, I want you to take out your clickers, and we're going to do a little bit of clicking. Nothing too bodacious. And we're going to type in an alphanumeric answer. Now, what that means is um, I'm going to give everybody correct because it's basically a survey. It's not a, it's not a, like a right or wrong answer. Okay, so just, uh, but, uh, just click in the A button or the B button. Here's the first one. Okay, oh, you got it now. Hit your refresh button. And just type in an A or a B just so I. No, you have to hit the send button. Sorry, send, hit the send button. Type in a letter and then hit the send button. Yeah, so hit the send button and then you'll get a check mark. And then I'll do the next question. All right, 10 seconds to finish. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay, let me just take a look at which. All right, we have six people with double answers. All right. Um, now, next question. Did you have a blank? Same thing, A or B? Just type in whichever one, and I'll give everybody correct points, uh, points for being correct on both of these. So just give me what you got. Whatever is true. Ten seconds to vote, starting right now. Nine, eight. 
seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, let's see what you guys got. Okay, four people had doubles. All right, now, uh, what I want, um, those of you that answered uh, yes for either of these, I want you to drop your paper off to me um, at the end of class. And what I'll do is I'll dig through the scantrons and I'll rectify your score. It might go up by one or two points, depending, you know, if you got something right. And I'll be able to tell, whereas the computer scoring system might not, you know, I'll be able to distinguish. All right, so do that at the end of class, and, and that'll be good. Any questions about that? Okay, let's keep going. Um, our next topic is, is actually the end of chapter three, universal gravitation, which we kind of skipped over to talk about the skateboard interaction between Bob and Carl. And now we're going to dip backwards uh, to finish chapter three. Uh, and then when we finish chapter three, gravitational concepts, uh, then we'll maybe get back to some impulse and interaction. And uh, and uh, ra raise your hand if you wouldn't mind dismissing a little early today. Okay, raise your hand if you if you don't want to dismiss early today. If you're against it, see everybody's looking around. See, so they want to see if there's some nerd that's you know, but there's not that many nerds in here except except for a few people that I know are nerds. Anyways, so we might dismiss a little early today. Uh, so chapter three, um, universal gravitation. Uh, we studied uniform circular motion and centripetal acceleration and stuff. Um, and those are important now for us because they are tools that Sir Isaac Newton had to develop in order to get a handle on his, his big target was the law of universal gravitation. He had an idea about the force that controls the orbit of the moon, the force between Earth and the moon that keeps the moon orbiting the Earth, and the force that makes apples fall out of apple trees and stuff. Baseballs come back down to Earth. You know, water balloons fall down towards the sidewalk. Now, in his day, I shouldn't say in his day, but prior to his day, like back in the days of Aristotle and stuff, they had this idea, that especially like Plato and those guys, that the heavens were like this um, idealized and perfect sphere. You know, all the stars were on this, what they call a celestial sphere. And we still use that terminology today, the celestial sphere to refer to what we see in the sky at night. Uh, even though now we know that the stars are all different distances away, they're not on a sphere. But in his day, they thought of them as, uh, in Aristotle and Plato's day, they thought of all the stars as being on a sphere and that that's where perfection was. And that terrestrial or mundane, as you would say in Latin, uh, was completely different. And that laws of things happening here on Earth uh, couldn't possibly be related to the uh, celestial sphere because that was perfect, you know. And so, and Earth was imperfect, the land of imperfect uh, people. And uh, so that was their thinking. And up until the day of uh, of Newton, the days of Newton, you know, nobody was was thinking, I mean, we think of it now as the gravitational pull. The Earth keeps us down, you know, free fall, baseballs, all that stuff, and also the moon, you know, because we, we're used to that thinking now. You know, we get it since fifth grade. And you even get it in cartoons, you know, even like Wiley, you know, uh, what is that? Uh, Roadrunner cartoons. You know, when Wiley goes off the cliff 
and he's out there for about five seconds until he realizes he's out there in the middle of the air, and then he drops. Okay, so they, they're playing with all this idea of gravity and stuff. Uh, but in Sir Isaac Newton's day, it wasn't clear. And so uh, you can read about it in the book. I developed the idea very carefully in the textbook. Uh, and so what he concluded was that, yes, there is this force of gravity that controls the moon's orbit and also the trajectory of an apple out of an apple tree. And that the days of Plato were over as far as physics and the, the principles of natural philosophy being different for the celestial sphere. He said, no, it's, you know, it's the same physics. It's a different, it looks different, but it's the same law. And, and that's what we're going to talk about. So he said, I think that this, this unusual law of gravitational force depends on two and only two physical factors. The, the mass of each object, so the mass of the earth and the mass of the moon, the mass of the apple and the mass of the earth, the mass of the sun and the mass of Jupiter, or, you know, whatever pair of gravitationally interacting objects you care to think of, uh, the mass of each object is one of the two factors. And then the other one is their distance apart. And Sir Isaac Newton said, you know, they're, they're, the more mass you have, the more gravitational pull. And he knew that because, the, you know, he, he figured that the Earth was getting pulled uh, by the moon and the moon was getting pulled by the Earth with the same size pull forces, Newton's third law. But the, the Earth was so much more massive, its, its accelerations were not that big, just like the two skateboarders. The, the skateboarder with the larger mass didn't get as much acceleration or speed. Same forces, but not as much acceleration. So Newton said, yeah, and, and also, if they're far apart, they're not going to interact as strongly. So the effect gets weaker with distance. All right. And he thought about that because he knew that the orbital speeds of the planets were quite slow the further out. You know, like, so Mars, the orbital speed was slower than Earth's. Venus was a little bit faster. Uh, and then out past Mars, Saturn and Jupiter, uh, and they knew uh, that those were even slower than Mars. Uh, so the distance apart, he thought, you know, it's got to be that, that it gets weaker with distance. Okay. So he said the more mass, the more force, and the more distance, the weaker the force. And the formula that he came up with uh, is basically this, uh, that the force of gravity – is a quotient, and in the numerator is the product of the two masses, m1 and m2. And in the denominator is the distance r between those two objects, and also that it, it's squared. It's the square of that distance. Okay, that's what we call an inverse r squared force. And that in front of the two masses, a multiplier or a, a conversion constant, capital G. Now, the reason that he figured that there had to be some kind of a conversion factor, capital G, so he called it capital G. Now we call it Newton's constant or the gravitational constant, is because if you think about it, the two measurements here are mass and mass in the numerator. So, so the numerator is kilograms squared, and the denominator is square meters, and that's not a Newton. So you have to convert, you know, so you have to have some kind of conversion factor from kilograms squared per meter squared into newtons. And that's what that conversion factor G is. Now, if, if you want to um, think about another conversion factor that you've probably uh, seen in like middle school science class, maybe, or, or high school science, um, or even math class, sometimes you... You, uh, you, they, they teach you about the Celsius temperature scale, which is the metric temperature scale. And, and the Celsius scale, there's uh, 100 degrees of Celsius temperature between uh, boiling water and freezing water. Now, in, in, uh, in the Fahrenheit that we use here in the United States mostly, it's 180 degrees. 
between uh, freezing and boiling. But for their metric, they, you know, metric system, they always like multiples of 10 and stuff. So they made 100 degrees, uh, and that's the Celsius. And the conversion factor, it, which is a pain in the uh, is like from Celsius to Kel from Celsius to Fahrenheit, you have to multiply by nine fifths. Anybody remember that? And I go the other way, you have to go multiply by five ninths. Remember, anybody raise your hand if you remember that? Is it doesn't strike it? It's I, actually I'm glad you don't remember it. But it, if you uh, you know if you were to you know mentally hypnotize yourself and comb your memories, you might you might come up with that from way back when you're when you're doing Kelvin or you're doing Celsius and Fahrenheit. So that's a here's here's another conversion factor. Uh, uh, what's the it's basically a ratio. What's the conversion factor from meters to kilometers? A thousand. And that's the metric system, so it's really easy. What's the conversion factor from a dozen to a gross? No, a gross is not one to one. Gross. What's a gross equal to? Who knows what a gross is? Nobody in here knows what a gross is. A gross is a dozen dozens. So the fact the conversion factor is 12. You know, if you have one gross, if you have two grosses, you have 24 dozens. And then multiply that by 12, and that'll be how many eggs you got. You know, so if you're if you're cooking breakfast or whatnot. All right, so capital G is a conversion factor, but and you can put this in your notes. It's not in, in my outline here, but I think it is in the textbook. Capital G also ends up being an extremely important physical factor. It's not just a conversion factor like five-ninths and nine-fifths for Celsius and Fahrenheit. Well, those are both man-made. But this, this, this capital G, it controls the size of, Black holes. You know that a black hole is a is an object that's so dense that even the, the escape velocity is even greater than the speed of light. So not even light can escape from a black hole. And no matter how powerful your rockets are, once you've crossed the event horizon, that's the point of no return, you ain't coming out. Okay, so that's the black hole. And you see them on TV talked about by different people and stuff. And the size of a black hole in ratio to its mass is controlled by capital G. There's a huge number of uh, other astrophysical things that are controlled by G, but that's the, that's the most important one, black holes. So it ends up being pretty important. And you can read more about it, how they first measured it uh, in the textbook. Um, uh, it's a very well verified force law. Now we're not gonna actually, Calculate a number of newtons with this. We could if we wanted to, all right. But we're not going to calculate a number of newtons. We're going to analyze the formula a little bit. But the guys down at NASA use this for us all the time. You know the hidden figures, uh, ladies and stuff. They do this all the time because that's the main force controlling spaceflight. You know they got these rockets, but those rockets only burn for a few minutes before they get up into orbit. And then, you know, maybe they have some retro rockets to, to maneuver it in place and stuff. And then some one more burn of rocket fuel to slow them down so that they can deorbit. But other than that, it's, it's gravity all the way. And so the guys at NASA have used this uh, at the wazoo and we know it very, very well. It's very highly uh, verified. And in fact, Einstein's theory of relativity uh, hasn't really, it's kind of replaced it in a way. Uh, GPS satellites depend on the theory of relativity. Um, but the, the GPS satellites are hyper accurate. And, and that's for the GPS that we have. The GPS that they have for the, the actual guys that invented it, the military, it's even more precise than that. You can, you can basically, using the theory of relativity, the, 
the, the, the very finest re refinements on this theory uh, from Einstein's theory, uh, you can judge that you can calculate the distance to the moon within a few centimeters, you know, the entire distance. And that's what G the GPS system could do. It's, it's fantastically accurate uh, if it's running. So it's a, it's a very well verified formula. We know that nature works like this. Now, uh, let's do an example here. Uh, here's that, the force log in. And this is, this is what it would look like if you were um, trying to figure out the motion of a spacecraft around the Earth. So the second slot in the numerator, M subscript, and then the subscript is a circle with a plus sign in it. That's the astronomical symbol for Earth. Okay. And then uh, we'll call the second mass the uh, subscript S for spacecraft. So if you have like uh, the space station or the space shuttle or the Hubble Space Telescope or any of these objects, object like the X-37 space plane up there in orbit, yeah, they gotta, they got to obey this formula. And then down at the bottom is R squared. All right. Now, this will also work. Uh, for elliptical orbits, uh, but we're going to mainly concentrate on circular orbits. Okay, but uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about elliptical orbits. Now, r squared, that would be the distance from the center of the Earth to the uh, center of mass of the spacecraft. All right, so that's the, so when you're doing this distance, you don't measure the altitude above the surface of the Earth. You know, the distance from Orlando out to the spacecraft. That's the altitude. The, the distance here is the distance from the center of the Earth out to the spacecraft. So that's about 6,371 kilometers for the radius of the Earth, and then whatever altitude above uh, Orlando that it, it is, you know. So that's your total distance. So that's distance from the center of the Earth to the spacecraft. And then, of course, you square it, all right? Now, that's, so that's, that's what you would work with. You know, so these guys down at Houston at Mission Control, they got half the PhDs on the planet working on this stuff. Uh, here's another variation. Uh, how about the Earth Moon or the Earth Sun system? Okay, so the first mass, it, it doesn't matter which order you put them because it's multiplying. The mass of the sun and that circle with a dot in the middle of it, that's the astronomical symbol for the sun. All right, and then the mass of the Earth, that's the second one in this example. And then, of course, you square the distance from the center of the sun to the center of the Earth. All right. And so if you were wondering about the orbit of Mars or the, one of the moons of Mars or one of the moons of Jupiter, you'd put in the, the mass of Jupiter's moon and the mass of Jupiter and then the distance out to the orbit of that moon. And you can figure out all kinds of stuff. All right. And it works out really well. And so Sir Isaac Newton's law of universal gravitation, we've never found it to be wrong. And even Einstein's theory of relativity didn't cancel out what Newton did. It just made it more powerful. Um, now, let's do an example with a satellite, all right? And uh, we're gonna put together this idea of universal gravitation and centripetal force that we talked about uh, last uh, Thursday. Okay, so that's, that's called synthesizing. We're putting together two ideas that were uh, disparate, separated, and now we're gonna try to put them together and see if it makes sense, all right? Now, centripetal force is mv squared over r for a circular orbit. So we're going to do circular orbits for satellites, and many satellites have circular orbits. Uh, some of them have elliptical, but we'll, we'll focus on circular orbits. All right. And so let's say that the mass of the Earth is capital M. The mass of the satellite is m subscript s. Now, the distance out to the spacecraft is set by NASA. You know, they're going to say, well, I want a spacecraft up there at 200 miles at about the same 
altitude as a space shuttle, all right? So that's about 300 kilometers, and so that's about 6,700 um, kilometers from the center of the Earth. So that's your R, and they square that, that's your R squared, all right? And they also have to um, use rockets to get up that high, all right? Now, if you get them up there and they don't have enough uh, juice, they don't have enough heat, they're not fast enough, they're going to come back down to Earth. So if you just lob it up there, you know, they'll get up there and then it'll come back down to Earth, all right? you got to have enough gumption in your rocket engines. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, I have this upper respiratory tract infection that's driving me insane. So sorry for coughing on Coughing on the microphone. Boy, I should dis disinfect this microphone. You better tell them that when you return it. So, um, so anyways, you, so NASA, they have to put some. So if it goes up into the, up to the orbit of a space shuttle, the space shuttle is going. You know how fast the space shuttle is going on its orbit, its orbital speed, about eighteen thousand miles an hour. It cir yeah, cir circles the Earth about uh, twice every three hours, about 90 minutes. You know, and they, they, they have variations. You know, they can put it, they, you know, they boost the altitude or bring it down by a few kilometers. But so up there, they're talk you're talking 17, 18,000. You know, all the Apollo and Gemini capsules orbited about that speed. So you've got to have a rocket that will get you up there and then have enough to get you up to 17,000 miles an hour. If you want to stay on orbit. So NASA's got to design all this stuff perfectly. All right. And they've got to use uh, the law of universal gravitation and basic centripetal force concepts. So if you're on a circular orbit, you can use the centripetal force formula that we had. Now, here they are. All right. The left side is universal gravitation, capital G times the mass of the Earth times the mass of the spacecraft divided by the square of the distance between the center of Earth and the spacecraft itself. Okay, so the, the radius of Earth is approximately 6371 kilometers. I don't know why I remember that, but I've used it so many times, I guess it's memorized. Now, on the right side is mv squared over r, and that applies for something that's going around a circle in the parking lot at Epcot. You know, a, a car of a certain mass with a certain speed and a radius of turn uh, or something at a Daytona or something on orbit. It doesn't matter. If it's a circular orbit, your, your uh, centripetal force required is mv squared over r. In this case, capital M subscript s. So here's your two, um, your two bindles. The gravitational bindle is on the left. And the, grab, and the centripetal uniform circular motion bindle is on the right, all right? Now, we're synthesizing those and setting them equal. And that's what Sir Isaac Newton was saying. You know, basically, uh, the centripetal acceleration that we see on Earth on a merry-go-round or anything else, you know, somebody throwing a lasso, you know, like cowboys do. You know, they throw those things. They circle them around and stuff. Uh, all that mv squared over r, I think, is the same as gm1 m2 over r squared. All right. Now, if you're if you're working at Q, at Mission Control for for NASA down in Houston, this is what you got to work with. All right. So let's take a look at this. All right. Now, notice anything interesting about this equation as it stands? Take a look at it. Notice anything? Interesting or raise your hand if you see something that's like interesting or useful or what do you see? I see you making a comment. Do you see something? Yeah, good ding. Give her a give her a bonus. Give her some uh, skittles. Give her some skittles. 
No, I didn't say. I said. No, I didn't say bonus points. I said Skittles. I took it back. All right. So cancel out those MSs. And that, my wonderful students, is one of the mysteries of the universe. Why a gravitational mass and an inertial mass for any circular motion should be the same, but apparently they are. We haven't ever disproven this either, that those two masses are the same. But they are. And so you can cancel them. And here's the leftovers. G times the mass of the Earth on top divided by R squared. And then over on the other side, V squared over R. Now, V squared over R, that's the centripetal acceleration. Okay. So G times capital M for the Earth over R squared is equal to the acceleration of gravity. That, basically, that's G. If, if we put 6371 kilometers quantity squared in the denominator here, it would work out to 9.8 meters per second squared. And if you, if you have something bigger than 6371 kilometers, like you're out there in the orbit of the space shuttle, it would be a little bit smaller. All right? And further and further away, much, much smaller. Now, anybody notice anything about that? Yeah, if you're out of space, you, there is gravity in space, but it gets smaller and smaller. Right. Anything, anything you – go ahead, Andrew. I, 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 I lost my thought. Okay. Anything else you see? What do you think? Are you, have, you got a, have you got an idea? No? Yes, she does. Okay. Who's got, who sees something? I got to learn more of your names. Go ahead. Who's, who's saying something? Go ahead. No, they're both squares. That's true. The two R's. You mean one on the left and one on the right? Well, there is an R on the right, but there's an R squared on the left. So that means you can cancel one of them. All right? So that means you can simplify one more step. Okay? So now the square of the speed, square of the orbital speed, is equal to capital G times the mass of the Earth divided by R. All right now, let me park that up here in the middle. We'll talk about this for a minute. All right. So that's – now we've synthesized universal gravitation and good old uniform circular motion. Okay. And now we can see something interesting. I mean, if you're on a, if you're on a circular orbit, this is always going to apply. All right. This is always going to be true. So think about this. If you know the radius r for the orbit that you want, then you can figure out the required speed v and then design your rockets appropriately because you got to get up to that and then you got to give them the speed v for the orbital, uh, you know, orbital speed. All right. So that's a design factor. Now, do we ever have that kind of a decision when we're trying to design spacecraft? Yes, a lot of times we want to have the satellite that's low enough to keep an eye on the Russians. And, you know, and, and I'm not kidding about this. The, the, the Hubble Space Telescope with all those lovely pictures, they got one of them pointing out towards outer space, and it's great. But, you know, they got a bunch more pointing down at the Russians and all those guys. And they're basically picking Boris Putin. What is that guy's name? Vladimir Putin's. They're checking out his wallet. They're checking out how many rubles he's got in his wallet. I mean, if they could see a galaxy several billion light years away and all that, they could definitely count the rubles in Vladimir Putin's back pocket if he wasn't such a – is anybody here from Russia? I, you know, because I had a student from Russia once that didn't like it. 
when I said something about Boris von Putin. A lot of people, you know, some of the, you know, some of the faculty in the physics department are like from Ukraine. And, oh, my goodness, they do not like Putin. They pronounce, that's how they pronounce it. Anyway, so if you want a spy satellite, you might want it down nice and close, orbiting close. It'll be going really fast, but you can, you know, you know, look down on the Russians every, every hour or so, every two hours. Now, if you need a certain orbital speed, you know, the two factors here are R, the orbital distance, and V, the orbital speed. So if you need a certain speed that it goes around the Earth, all right, then you can figure out the, re the required altitude and then the radius R of the orbit, all right? So for instance, let's say that you want a satellite that's just fast enough to orbit Earth once a day, right? So it's a 24-hour orbit. Now, the nice thing about that is, you know, the Earth is spinning on its axis once a day. So if you're orbiting once a day and the Earth is spinning once a day, and if you're at the equator, you're going to be looking down at the same point every day. And that's what we call uh, a geosynchronous satellite. That's communication satellites. You know, if you have direct TV uh, or any of these big, uh, you know, if you see the like Channel 9 Eyewitness News van, you know, coming up to campus and they got a big uh, antenna up on top. And before they can transmit back to the studio, they got to aim it at the satellite. It's a big, nice, you know, big, nice antenna. And But then once they get it set, then they don't have to re-aim it until they move their truck, all right? And when you, if you have direct, raise your hand if you know, if you have direct TV at home or satellite dish network or something like that. Oh, my goodness. Everybody else is a cable TV subscriber? I stream. Oh, my goodness. You just stream yeah, on the Internet? Oh, my goodness. Anyways, dish TV, uh, uh, direct TV, uh, those are geosynchronous satellites. You, you aim your, your antenna at the right spot in the sky and just, just bolt it down, and you'll get those transmissions from that satellite. And, and uh, so, that's, so this is an example. Now, we haven't done any calculations. We'll leave that to these eggheads down in Houston at Mission Control. Yep. You know, my comrades, my brothers in arms. This the rocket scientists, which they got a ton of down in Houston. Now, here's a couple. Uh, let me pause for questions before we go and talk some more. Okay, good. Now, uh, let's talk about a couple other space scientists. Edmund Halley and Isaac Newton. And these are two, they were friends. So Edmund Halley, or some people call it Edmund Haley. Nobody really knows how he pronounced his name. Um, he, they were contemporaries and uh, they were friends. And Edmund Haley actually helped Sir Isaac Newton publish his big book, The Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, which we call the, you know, in Latin, the Principia. Now, these two guys were scientific friends, and Halley was interested in, in comets. So let's talk about <clears throat> comets. Uh, one of the famous applications that Newton, you know, you know, once he figured out that universal uh, gravitation was kosher, he said, all right, let's apply this to comets and, and elliptical orbits in general. So... The, the astronomer, the astronomer named uh, Kepler had already found that the planets always orbit on ellipses, not, not necessarily circles, but slightly elliptical. Mars is, is noticeably elliptical. Earth is elliptical, but it's very close to a perfect circle. Uh, but the comets and stuff orbit on ellipses. Okay. And so planets, comets, etc., they orbit on an ellipse like this. And the sun is at one focus of the ellipse. 
Now, we're not going to calculate. If we were in astronomy class, we would do that. Calculate the position and stuff of the sun. But that yellow dot at the center there, that's to represent the SUN. And the elliptical shape, that's the path uh, of the orbit. Now, the other thing that Kepler figured out and that Newton proved must be true is that equal areas are swept out by equal times. So what that means is if you, if, if you on this diagram, if you put a marker down for every period of time t as the object orbits counterclockwise, starting, let me turn around, starting right here uh, at zero, and then here's one t later, and here's two t later, three t later, four t, five, and all the way around to uh, 13 t, and then here's 14, and it starts over. If you were to do that for any ellipse for a planet, those little pie-shaped wedges, um, alternating blue and white colors, the areas of all of them are the same. They're different shapes, but you calculate the area, which is a lot of math, and you find out that the areas are all the same. So if you divide up the time by times, um, and this is kind of an idealization of it. Um, so Newton proved that this is true. And then the other thing he proved was that the uh, average orbital distance um, to the third power is proportional to the orbital period, um, the square of the orbital period. Now, the fancy way of writing that is this. Orbital period, P squared, is equal to that big bracket of constants times a to the third power. That's the average orbital distance, A. So now the stuff inside that kind of shaded in blue area, everything in there is a constant. There's capital G. There's the mass of the sun and the mass of the planet, M1 and M2. So those are constants. And pi is up on top. That's a constant. You know, 3.14, 15, blah, blah, blah. All right. And so all that stuff in there is a constant. And guess what? In the solar system, all that junk in there, inside that bracket, it looks really nasty. It's exactly equal to one. It's pretty nice. It, it works out exactly to one. If you measure the orbital period in years and the uh, orbital distance in multiples of Earth's orbital distance. Uh, so um, now we're not going to make calculations with this. But I do want to show you that the formula that they were working with. Okay. Uh, so this is the – get my cursor back. Now, Halley, uh, he surmised that comets follow these orbital paths, these elliptical orbits. And he knew – and everybody knew um, that um, comets aren't on circles most of the time. They're on elliptical orbits, so they could be really oblong like this one, all right? And so he said, if that's true, a comet will return periodically. And he didn't know, you know, you never know until you study the shape of its orbit how long it's going to take to come back, all right? But um, and some comets that we now know have orbital periods of 20,000 years. You know, they, they, they come in close to the sun, and then they go way far out into the solar system, and they're poking along out there for 20,000 years before they come back in for another lap of the sun. Uh, so we've seen those uh, over the years. Uh, but um, Haley, Edmund Haley, had cataloged a lot of the comets from the historical record. Now, nobody thought of the, – they always thought the comets were a, a harbinger of disaster. You know, if a comet comes and, you know, it's going to be – a lot of people thought, oh, the king is going to die or the, there's going to be a war or something like that. They thought it was a fore, foretelling of doom, but they didn't realize that comets come back every so many years, you know, 20,000 years or maybe a few years. All right, we have some very short period comets that we know of now. Now, what Haley did was he predicted this. He looked at the comet of 1531, the comet of 1607, and the comet of 1682. 
And he said, you know what? Those are coming in at about 75, 76 year periods there. Okay. So Haley said, I think that that is one comet, not just some one off once and never to return. But he said, I think that's the same comet. And that it's going to come back in 1758. And by God, it did. About Christmas time, 1758. And both Haley and Newton were dead by that time. You know, they passed a few years before that. But it did come back right on time. Right on time. Right at Christmas time, in fact. And that, my wonderful students, was the numbers doing the talking. Haley made a prediction of a future state. And he was right on the money. And for Galileo, that means, ding, your theory is correct. This, it, it, in those days, this was an enormous verification. You can't imagine what it would, would, was like. You know, the only thing, you know what it would be like is if somebody said, yeah, there are, there are um, aliens on Jupiter. And then somebody sent a spacecraft up there and, and found, yeah, there are, there are aliens on Jupiter. It'd be of that magnitude. All right, so this is a gigantic check mark for the theory of universal gravitation. Gigantic. And this comet is the one that we, and you guys will see it, hopefully, many of you, by the time you're, you're old and gray. And I'll be, I'll, you know, when is this going to come again? I, I can't know. I don't know when it's going to come again, but I haven't figured out the next turn. But maybe I'll be around, maybe not. But you, most of you will. You see Haley's Comet? And, it, and if, it's, if it comes once in a lifetime, unless you're born, like Mark Twain was born when it, Haley's Comet came, and he died when Haley's Comet came back the second time. But you'll see it. You'll see it come, hopefully. Haley's Comet, the famous Haley's Comet. Now, on Tuesday... Uh, we're going to go back to impulse and interactions, and that means chapter four. Uh, and over the weekend, I'm going to give you a, a, a workout, homework four, uh, and I'll try to get it ready by lunchtime tomorrow. You have all weekend to work on it. Okay, you're dismissed. If you want to get your printout, come on up to the front.